All right, folks. Welcome uh, to Remote Desktop Services. This is BRK3098. Just making sure that you're all in the right session. I am Joydeep Mukherjee. I am part of the marketing group here in the Enterprise Mobility team. I'm joined today by Scott Manchester, our lead uh, on the PM side, on the program manager side. I will introduce uh, him to you guys in just a few moments. And we also have a, a special guest today uh, that I will also bring on stage in, in just a few moments here. So before we start today, can I have a really quick show of hands uh, as, to, as to who, what level of awareness is there in, in the room about remote desktop services? That's what I'm trying to get at. So please raise your hands if you know and work with remote desktop services. This is awesome. We can skip right to the end. <laughs> right, see, that, that was just to get a laugh out of you. I know it's, it's, it's after lunch, so hopefully that woke you up a little bit. Anyway, so great, great that you all have context about remote desktop services, and we have a lot to share with you today, not just in terms of technology and what we are doing in Windows Server 2016 uh, with RDS, but also in terms of how some of our customers are really uh, bringing those technologies to life in their own uh, solutions. Right. So I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but remote desktop services is essentially, from Microsoft, remote desktop services is essentially a platform. It is a platform that lets you, as the IT admin of the broader organization, to deliver Windows apps to any device. Now, that is its base function. In doing that, it provides you a, a, a wealth of benefits, benefits uh, ranging from access to Windows apps from anywhere, uh, the flexibility to deploy either on-premises or increasingly now in a hybrid or cloud environment. That brings with it uh, many cost uh, cost related efficiencies, both from moving from a CapEx to OpEx model, also from, uh, from high utilization of existing inter infrastructure. And on then on the client device side, you don't have to cycle out your client devices all that often. So all these are some of the benefits that I'm sure many of you are seeing in your own organizations. But most importantly, it is a secure platform, and it is an extensible platform. The world of desktop virtualization or the world of virtualized workspaces is a very fragmented, and when I say fragmented, I mean highly customizable world, world right? So every organization has their own unique needs, and it's, and it's not always easy to fit it into one solution or the other. So a, level, a high level of customization is always required, which is why Microsoft has taken the position of being the platform to power those uh, customized solutions through our partners. OK, so in terms of actual solutions, where does it all come? <clears throat> Again, I know that many of you are familiar with all these. So on-premises, there are two main ways to consume the technologies within uh, RDS. Uh, these are, one, session-based computing, uh, where you have a server instance divided up into sessions and connect into those sessions to deliver your apps. Uh, or it is the one-is-to-one -one virtual desktop in infrastructure, or VDI, the true the, the true term terminology of VDI. Now, in the cloud, you have, uh, you have the option of doing session-based uh, remoting through RDS deployed on Azure IaaS, that is in, uh, our Azure Infrastructure as a Service. That use case and that business case just became a whole lot stronger with Windows Server 2016, as we today will discuss. And then my friend Clark will talk to you tomorrow about, ab about those, and I'll give you his session details too. <clears throat> also, earlier in the year, we announced something path-breaking in, in terms of Windows licensing. We said that if you are an EASA customer on CBB for Windows 10, you could actually deploy your Windows 10 desktops on Azure. Now, that's a great licensing benefit that, bring, that, that, that speeds your uh, virtual workspace strategy to the cloud. But then we also are innovating closely with our partners, uh, initially Citrix, uh, to build management solutions on top of that. 
So that's another great new area of innovations in terms of just solutions that meet uh, your or your customers' requirements. So how does it all come together? How does it all get delivered to you? They're, these are delivered through remote desktop clients. Uh, we have clients across uh, the broad range of platforms today. Uh, so, so these not only keep your data safe, from the IT admin side, but also provide your users with a great native uh, experience on whatever device they, they choose uh, to consume uh, RDS technologies. But enough about us talking about how great we are and what value we provide to you. Let's quickly see how, uh, some, of our, how some of our customers are using this. So today, let's start with can we have audio, please? Sorry, just a second while we roll the video. Can we have audio? Can we have audio? Audio for the feed? I apologize, technical difficulties will take just a minute. Oh, this one. This is on HDMI, okay. This, okay. okay. Sorry, guys, I'll play the audio again. Thank you for your patience. With that, it's my great pleasure today to welcome on stage Mark Yumera, my friend from Rakuten. Uh, please welcome him on stage with a great <laughs> hands. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. And thanks also for sharing some of your experiences through our calls uh, earlier, uh, earlier this year when you were going through the, uh, this deployment, especially your US deployment. 
Now, uh, in the video, there was a very good grounding and kind of the b basic motivation behind, you know, BYOD and the, and the importance of security in that, uh, in, in that sense. And, and that's why you ch chose to go down this path. But in our calls, you also mentioned kind of the scalability advantage or, or the dynam dynamic scalability uh, that an RDS deployment provides you both on-prem in Japan and, and in the US, uh, which is more of a hybrid scenario. Talk to, talk to us a little bit about that. OK, well, first of all, in Japan, we built out uh, infrastructure based on uh, 2012 R2 and Windows 8.1 as clients, and 7,000 concurrent VMs uh, as capacity, all on-prem. Uh, so that we, we learned quite a lot doing that. And uh, for, the, for the Americas, we wanted to take a different approach. Generally, uh, in most environments, you're going to get maybe 15 or 20 percent concurrent usage. So there's a lot of wasted resources. So for the American solution, uh, we, we wanted to actually build uh, a small minimal footprint on premise and then scale to Azure and then scale back when we didn't need to use those resources. So it made a lot of sense from a TCO perspective. OK, great. Um, and, and then uh, this is, uh, how, how does this translate? Uh, you, you talked to, about the TCO perspective. How does this translate in the CapEx, OpEx conversation? Uh, how does that help you there? Well, <laughs> I, I, I'm not too sure that um, uh, maybe everyone is concerned about costs, but uh, we, we didn't. We wanted to satisfy a number of things, and cost was actually one of the least kind of uh, inhibitors. One was uh, all around security. We we also uh, acquire a lot of companies at a pretty fast rate, so it was really easy, inexpensive, non-intrusive way to to integrate companies. Uh, we also wanted to enable BYOD, and we. We assumed uh, people would be coming in from their home PCs uh, from essentially compromised, untrusted, malware-infected machines, and we wanted to work around that space and at least give them access to all the resources that they needed uh, with some level of confidence that there was, uh, it was very difficult to leak and lose data. Perfect. Thanks again for joining us today, Mark. Pleasure. Please give him another round of applause here, Mark Yamera. So with that, Mark talked a little bit about the Windows Server 2016 features within RDS and how that has helped their US deployment. Uh, I would like to now welcome on stage Scott Manchester, our lead uh, from the program management side, who will talk to us more about some of these great innovations. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I get to show some fun stuff. So I'm going to show you guys a few demos. Let's, uh, let's do a little bit of framing in slides, though. How many people were at the uh, mechanics session this morning where we talked about RDS? All right, well, some of you are going to be a little bored. We're going to show some of the same things we showed this morning, but maybe we'll provide a little more color around it. Um, with RDS in 2016, we really focused in three areas. Uh, number one was increased performance, and this is primarily around our graphics performance, although I'll show you some examples where we increased performance in other areas as well. The second was about our scalability. Um, one of the, one of the problem spaces we have with scalability of our pure RDS deployment is in our connection broker. It's kind of the heart of the engine of an RDS deployment. It's responsible for maintaining state of the users and which sessions they're connected up to. Um, and it does a lot of read and writes to database to maintain that state. And it supports high availability mode, so you can have multiple connection brokers trying to maintain state. So we made some significant improvements in this, made it a lot less chatty, made it more robust, uh, and also made it uh, more cost effective to deploy because now you can share uh, a SQL cluster deployment. Uh, and the last one, and probably one of the most important ones, especially as you hear about all the work that's happening in the cloud, was work that we've been doing, and this is ongoing, to optimize RDS for cloud deployments. You heard from Mark about how it facilitated uh, some uh, cost savings and, and ability for them to secure uh, their corporate assets and allowing um, seasonal employees or new employees as they acquire companies to quickly access company resources in a secure way. Um, tons of exciting scenarios around the cloud here, so we'll cover some of those uh, today in a minute. Oops, wrong machine. So I mentioned that graphics was a big investment for us, and we've had a long revolution, or uh, evolution, uh, plus a revolution in 2016, but a long evolution of our, our graphics uh, GPU uh, virtualization uh, and our remote FX pipeline. So we started back with the early versions of RemoteFX back in uh, 2008 R2, and we've slowly progressed over the years, adding more and more capabilities. Um, starting in 2016, 
we had more of a revolutionary change in that we now support a new GPU virtualization solution called Discrete Device Assignment, or DDA. And this is really a Hyper-V feature that we take advantage of, where now you can take a, a GPU, and maybe it's a, a card that has more than one GPU on it, and you can assign a single GPU from that card into your VM. Um, with that, you get full API support. So the, all the problems that, that uh, typical GP virtualization solutions have had in the past where you're running a proxy driver that may not have full API capability, those problems go away. You're running the latest and greatest drivers uh, running natively in your VM. So really exciting opportunities there. Uh, in addition to that, we also added uh, support for our session host servers to have access to the GPU in a multi-session environment. So multiple people can all be sharing the GPU now. Now, this is something you'll want to do your own performance evaluations, depending on your apps and how well they behave in an environment like that. But it does open up some new opportunities for you to create unique configurations to facilitate workloads that require a GPU. So lots of activity happening there, lots of new innovation. Um, also, while we've been doing this development, the Azure team has been working on adding GPUs uh, to the cloud. So, uh, you've probably seen some of the demos uh, and some talks about this. If it's the first time you're hearing about it, then, then I'm excited to share this with you, uh, that there's GPUs coming to Azure. They're in preview now. I'm going to show you a demo of that in just a minute. Um, but you'll be able to uh, start running production-level workloads later this year. Um, and I'll give you a link to where you can sign up for the preview. I think it's pretty full now, but it doesn't hurt to try. Um, but we'll talk about that more in, in a minute. So. We've also made some significant enhancements to our graphics pipeline, primarily our encoder that we use with the new RDP 10.2 protocol. So if you're running Windows Server 2016 and you've got a Windows 10 client, when you connect up these two endpoints, uh, they'll go into our new 10.2 mode uh, as long as there's a GPU in the host. Um, you can also override this. You can change those settings and revert back to 8.1 or force to 10.2 if both endpoints support it. But with our 10.2 protocol, we've really made some innovations here. And I think it's one thing that's somewhat unique to our protocol. Uh, a lot of the competing protocols or platform protocols that ride on top of RDS have had video encoding algorithms in them for some time. What's unique about ours is we can actually reproduce um, the encoding using an AVC444 method while leveraging an AVC420 encoder and decoder. So that's really important because there's not a lot of AVC444 encoders and decoders available in consumer devices today. Um, so if you either make it the choice of reverting back down to a 420 encoding, which is primarily used for video production, and it works fine when you're watching a video and there's a lot of motion on the screen, you don't really notice any degradation or any of the artifacts unless there's specific scenes. Um, but if you're staring at a screen, a static screen with high contrast you know, uh, text and, and graphics, then if you're looking at a 420 encoder, you're going to notice a difference. You're going to see the loss of luminance and chroma information that happens in a 420 encoding. So what we do is very clever, is we use the 420 on both ends, and then we provide the additional luma and chroma that's normally dropped in a 420 compression. Uh, we send it via a side channel, and then overlay it back onto the, onto the endpoint. I'll show you a demo in a minute of us running in 10.2 mode, and you'll judge for yourself the, the quality that you can receive. Uh, we're continuing to evol evolve our protocol. So with 10.2, it's a great leap forward. 10.3 is already in the pipeline, which uh, will continue to improve on the performance, both in terms of the CPU overhead uh, and the bandwidth. So we're continuing to allow this to perform better and better on smaller pipes and leverage less and less of the CPU resources on both endpoints. All right, now the fun stuff. So let's move to a demo real quick. I think I'm on five. So what I'd like to show you, let's see here. This is uh, a VM running in Azure. This is running in uh, South Central US. Um, and this is one of the Azure N SKUs. So if I go in here and I bring up Device Manager, let's see, where is it, Device Manager? You can see here, if I have under displays, boom, there's a Tesla M60 uh, video card running there. OK? Um, that card actually has two GPUs on it, and there's two of those cards in this chassis. Um, and what we've done is, through Hyper-V, actually running in the Azure Fabric in this case, they've mapped one GPU into this VM, and it's available to me here running the actual local drivers. So I'm going to show you a couple applications here. 
let's bring up this uh, eDocs viewer from Dassault. And here you can see I've turned on some high visual effects. If I start this rotating, you can see it performs really, really well. Given time, I'll show you an example of this running in a VM with, without a GPU, and you can kind of compare the difference. But the quality of this and the performance I get here opens up a whole new set of scenarios now. So if you're a graphics designer, if you traditionally work in these CAD CAM type of applications, you've typically been chained to your desk where you've got that high performance uh, machine. Now you can grab your iPad, you can grab your Surface machine, and you can go anywhere in the world, remote into that machine, and have this high performing graphics uh, experience. So it really opens up a lot of new opportunities for different workloads. So I'm going to show you that same image in uh, uh, Autodesk Fusion 360. And you can see here the performance when I manipulate this around now. If I didn't tell you I was running this in a VM, you would never even guess. Let's zoom in on this and look at the lines. Now, this traditionally, an image like this with high contrast regions would look horrible when it's encoded using a video encoding algorithm. You'd see a lot of artifacts. We've all seen those before, right, when you're seeing encoded video or even encoded pictures. Uh, and you can see here the clarity uh, provides a whole new level of quality that um, really, for someone who's sitting hours and hours behind a workstation, you know, drawing these kind of images, it's very taxing on the eyes to see those uh, blurry lines. So great quality in the visualization here and great performance. Um, I think I'm running at too high of a resolution to show the game demo, but let's see how well it performs. This, uh, this is a brand new uh, 3D performance benchmarking tool from Unigen. Uh, they've, they've had this, uh, a few other, it well, looks like it might work for us. Uh, they've had a few other of these uh, benchmarking tools out for some time. You might have seen the Heaven demo uh, or the Valley demo. This is brand new. I got this from the developer like two days ago, hot off the press. Um, this is really, really taxing on the GPU. And you can see we're rendering it at 30 frames per second, and it's probably hard to read in the corner, but we're actually rendering right now uh, almost 5 million uh, polygons. So not only has this got a high level of polygons, and in fact, I'll turn, on the, I'll turn on the wireframes and give you some idea. Let's see here. Let's see if I can get that to show up. There we go. So you can see all the polygons that are being rendered right now. Um, in some of the scenes, it, it, it draws up to 7 million polygons. And there's 560 different surfaces in this world. And there's 36 um, sources of uh, dynamic lighting. Um, in addition to that, you're seeing, I'm going to turn the wireframe back off. You'll see some of the cinematic effects that are happening here. Like you can see the ink bottle's in focus. And then the other one wasn't in focus. And now the blur is changing. That's post-processing transforms that they're doing after the rendering is completed. And there's like 50 of those post-processing transforms that are happening. So we're really taxing this GPU. Um, any other GPU virtualization solution that didn't give you that near bare metal performance, this scenario wouldn't even work. This may not be the type of applications you're going to be remoting, but it's a great example of the kind of performance you can get now um, with DDA and, and being able to run the native graphics driver. So let me switch back over here. Uh, seven. So I mentioned to you that one of the areas we made significant improvements was in our um, connection broker. I also mentioned that now you can use an existing uh, SQL database. Um, if you're deploying in Azure, you can use Azure SQL DB and set up high availability with multiple uh, connection brokers. And we've really focused on improving, improving the performance of our connection broker. It was a source of, of slow connection times um, when we were in an environment where we called a login storm, where you had a significant number of people trying to connect or disconnect at the same time. And it just took a lot of time for our broker to make reliable connections. And, and you may have heard from your uh, customers you're supporting, or perhaps you experienced it yourself, uh, where it could take up to a minute or so sometimes to connect in those kind of you know, high volume states. Now we test up to 10,000 concurrent connections. That's part of our, our test pass that we do now. And I've personally run some of these tests and really tried to tax the system and really tried to break our broker. And it's, it's held up really well. We have this great tool, a simulation tool that one of our developers built um, that we use now to do validation of our broker. So any code changes we make, any uh, performance improvements we make, we can go run this simulator and, and put together, like, the, dynamically create this environment that would really tax it. So I'd like to show you how that simulator um, behaves, give you an example of uh, what we're talking about. Let me shut down this VM over here. All right. 
So in this simulation, uh, we're just starting it off right now. We're able to create this configuration file to kind of define the environment that we want to test to. So in this particular test pass that I'm going to run here in a second, uh, we've got 1,000 total users, and we've got 100 session host servers. Now our broker is responsible for load balancing those users across those uh, session host servers. I'm going to have 100 people connect immediately, all at the exact same time, and then I'm going to have four users per second connect after that. Each, session, uh, each user session is going to be about two minutes, and then those users will start to log off. So midway through this, you're going to see people coming in and people logging off and really taxing the system. Now, this whole demo would take about 20 minutes, so I ran this earlier, and this is the output of that, uh, of that workflow. So this, um, let me go back and show you actually. So it goes through, creates all the users if they don't already exist in Active Directory. It'll go and create all the session host servers, register them with the broker. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here. So it's going through all that process of creating uh, all those things. And then I'm going to get into the middle of the deployment. And this is just spitting out logs of information, like how well this is performing, tons of details that we can use to analyze how well our connection broker is performing. So I'm going to pause it here, and we'll take a look at just one of these lines here. Um, so you can see here we have 481 current sessions, 828 successful. So we've got people logging off and logging in right now. And here's the killer number, zero failures. Let's just say that in previous generations of a broker, this would not be zero. So definite significant improvement there. We'll jump to the end of this now. This is the, the log file that spit out at the end. It gives us the average connection time, the minimum connection time, the maximum connection time, and most importantly, the number of failures. Because really, the thing that really drives the, the long connection times are failures and retries, when that person has to get back into the back of the queue and then, and then to work, their, work themselves back up. Uh, so huge improvement here. As I mentioned, we test up to 10,000 concurrent users now. Um, we know there are other limitations with RDS natively when you're running pure RDS to scale to that size, but a lot of our partners have built some really exciting um, solutions on top of RDS to enable you to scale to much larger. In fact, uh, Freak, I think I saw him in the office, or I'm sorry, Benny, Benny's out here somewhere. He's, um, Benny's going to give a session on Friday uh, where he'll take you through some of the other third-party tools and, and resources that are available uh, for you to uh, extend your RDS deployment and build on top of that platform. Okay. So I'll go back to here. All right. Um, so the last focus area for us was on work that we did to optimize RDS for the cloud. In fact, if you guys have questions in this area, we've got Clark Nicholson, a, a PM on the team, uh, and, and, our, and our architect in this space, uh, that's done a lot of work to make it really easy to deploy RDS in the cloud, and working really closely with the Azure team to expose some new capabilities um, primarily in the Azure Active Directory space uh, that really make setting up an RDS deployment simple. In fact, Clark has led a, a team of uh, engineers that have built some quick start templates. And I'll show you a demo of some of those quick start templates that can really aid in your deployment of RDS. You can just click a couple of buttons and it'll build an entire RDS deployment for you. And then they've made some additional tools that you can then uh, make that deployment highly available. You can scale it out, add different session host servers, and they've also given you some options so that you can either point to your own golden image or it'll use a base image out of the gallery. Right now, the deployments uh, are based off of uh, 2016 TP5. We'll have those updated to 2016 as soon as they show up in the gallery. Um, but the important things to note here is if you've done RDS deployments in the cloud before, it would take you up to a seven VMs, depending how you configured it, uh, or seven roles with eight VMs. And because of some of the changes that we've made in terms of how we work behind Azure Active Directory, uh, domain services and app proxy, you can sig significantly reduce that down to four role services and four VMs, and that's highly available. So you can set up a highly available deployment with four VMs, uh, and then you can set up as many session host servers as your deployment needs. So let me switch back real quick, and I apologize for the back and forth, but I want to show you guys some real active uh, code here. So let me bring up browser. And I'll show you where to find these. All right, switch over here. So you can find these resources by going under uh, Azure and then go down to uh, Templates right from the portal. And you can see here, there's, there's 416 templates available uh, in, in this gallery right now. Um, and if I just do a quick search for RDS, 
There's, you can see there's four available today, and we're constantly adding more here. In fact, soon you'll be able to do a full RDS deployment right through the gallery. Go new, type in RDS, and boom, there'll be an option there for you. And within that gallery uh, configuration, you'll be able to set all the parameters you want and configure you know, a customized RDS deployment. For now, this is a great way of getting things started. Uh, gives you an opportunity to, to kick the tires on Windows Server 2016 and, and easily set up an RDS uh, deployment inside of Azure. So let's look at this one here, the session collection deployment. So it takes me to a page that shows me some background information about this particular quick start template. There's a number of variables you set here. You can see it's a really short list. I think there's seven parameters that you provide. And then right from here, you can actually click Deploy to Azure. So it'll take me right to my portal. Um, and from there, I can enter in those parameters, and it takes me through a setup. Now, that setup takes about, I don't know, an hour, I think, to, to configure all those VMs and set up the whole deployment. So again, I, I did one earlier today. Um, so here it is in my, in my um, actually, there's a link right from my um, dashboard. But uh, within that, you can see for this resource group, it set up a storage account. It set up a VNet, um, a public IP with a load balancer in front of it. There's all the virtual NICs that I'd be using. There's the two session host servers. So by default, it, it sets up two session host servers, but I could have put in 10. And I also, um, running the other optional quick start template, I could have pointed to my own image if I didn't want to use the, the gallery um, 2016 TP5 image. Um, in addition, it set up all those infrastructure roles that we needed. Uh, but the cool thing, it also pre-configured uh, this deployment with a high availability set so that if I do want to turn this deployment into a highly available set and actually use it for production workloads, I go back to those quick start templates. There's another one there that I can convert this into highly available. So it'll add those additional infrastructure roles that we need to ensure that this thing is very robust if, if any of the VMs go down. OK. So there's a number of other investments we made uh, in the storage space area. Um, we support the, the new features that the Hyper-V team has exposed. One is uh, storage spaces, uh, storage and Hyper-V team. Storage spaces replica, uh, which gives you an easy way to replicate your uh, storage across multiple data centers. Storage quas is a Hyper-V feature that enables you to ensure that you're getting, um, uh, preventing noisy neighbors from stealing all the IOPS in, uh, in file transfers and such. So you can set a minimum and maximum point there, which is great. Um, and then, of course, Storage Spaces Direct uh, is a really new, exciting uh, storage solution that will allow you to set up high available uh, file storage in Azure uh, that will enable you to have domain join file stores. So I know many of you have played with Azure Files. There's some limitations there now, although they're continuing to work on that. Um, but this is a great solution today that you can run high availability um, storage in Azure um, with domain join file system. I think I jumped ahead on, the, uh, on that demo. So there was a number of other improvements. Uh, I won't go into details on those. Um, obviously, with the Hyper-V enhancements, we're able to take advantage of some of those new security features um, by enabling uh, support for Gen 2 VMs. Um, my team also uh, builds the remote desktop clients, and we're constantly innovating and, and delivering new value in the remote desktop clients. So we've got them on every platform, Windows, Windows Phone, iOS, Android, and Mac. Um, we're constantly innovating and constantly providing um, new capabilities with those. Um, again, uh, Clark, as our, as our team architect, also helped uh, create a new uh, solution for deploying uh, personal session desktops in Azure. Until recently, there was no real way to do VDI in Azure because of, with the client OS because of licensing restrictions. Um, now that is available, that's a whole other talk. Um, but we now have a solution to deploy Think of it as a, a personal session desktop, a session, session host server with one user with admin privileges. So really flexible opportunity for you if you wanted to have a high performance uh, VDI instance uh, in Azure. Uh, and then uh, Windows Multipoint service used to be a SKU of its own uh, that enabled people to do simple RDS deployments for more classroom type scenarios. And that was a, a, a specific server SKU. Now, Windows Multipoint Services is now just another role within uh, Windows Server, which is interesting because you can take some of the capabilities of Multipoint and add them to your standard RDS deployment now. It gives you those opportunities. So that's kind of the summary of what we've done in 2016. Uh, there's a number of other related sessions. I mentioned the one that uh, Benny's giving on Friday. That's the bottom one. 
Uh, some of these have already taken place, but you can watch them offline, so I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, tomorrow, Clark and some other folks from the team are going to do a deeper dive on RDS deployments in Azure. So if you got inspired or excited by some of the things you saw here, come listen to Clark and Christian tomorrow to go into even more detail. For those of you that are starting to sneak out, uh, we are going to be available here for Q&A. So at the end of this session, uh, Clark and some of the other experts on the team will be here. Uh, so we'll, um, we'll take your questions um, up front. And uh, I think while we have time, we can also got a couple of mics set up here so we can, we can do some that way. Uh, we want your feedback. We hope you enjoyed this session. We wanted to make sure that you understood the platform capabilities of RDS, get a chance to hear from a customer doing real-world deployments, and understand some of the new capabilities that we've exposed. So I invite you to give us feedback. We'd love to hear from you. It really does make a difference for us. Um, any questions for now, please go to the mics. And then uh, those of you that want to just come up and talk to someone personally, you can do that as well. Thank you.